And when there is no vision, the people perish. We choose to go to the moon. If today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? Change will not come if we wait for some other person or if we wait for some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Welcome to the Strategy Skills Podcast, where strategy partners teach you the tools and techniques to solve mankind's greatest problems. Hey everyone, I want you to put your hands together for the one and only Dr. Wendy Suzuki. Before I introduce Wendy and we start talking about this, I'm going to take a few seconds and just talk to you about why she is with me here today. I would think that there are very few people in the world who have ever gotten me to read a book with pink on the cover. Now, I wear pink. I have a lot of pink ties, but a book with pink on the cover, that's pretty rare. The reason I read this book is because it was referred to me by someone who told me that it's going to have a big impact in my life. And at this point, I was thinking about how to be more productive. I was busy working on a concept for clients and how to be more productive. And someone gave me this book. And basically what this book is saying, or what Wendy is describing as a life journey, is that she discovered that if she takes better care of her body and mind and energy levels, somehow there's a connection with the way she thinks, her smartness, her ability to get things done. Now, Wendy is going to go into more details about how this all works in a few minutes. But to me, this resonated quite strongly because what I notice is that when you are young, we don't really care about our bodies. I mean, let's be honest. Everyone says they do, but most people don't. You don't sleep well. You go out partying all the time. And your body is brand new, like a brand new computer. It, it kind of can take the beating. But over time, the software, your brain, which is sitting in the hardware, your body, the hardware can't handle what your brain wants to do. And things start slowing down a little bit. Now, that was my theory. It's kind of obvious. But then this book explains a couple of things, why that happens, and also how to fix the problem. You will find that as you become older, I would say at any age, if you want to get the most out of your life, you have to find a way to make sure that you are reading the right things and developing your intellect, but for lack of a better word, the hardware, where those ideas sit, it needs to be taken care of so you can achieve the best that you possibly can. Now, I've enjoyed the book reading it. I like the fact that Wendy is extremely honest on some very embarrassing things as well, and she shares all of that with you and allows you to see, firstly, what led to this epiphany, for lack of a better word, and how she used it to develop a way that other people could think about the same problems and make improvements. So I would recommend you read the book because the stories are very interesting. And I think when you read Wendy's anecdotes and her life experiences, you remember it better. But I would also think that beyond just wanting to read an interesting book, you're going to use this as one weapon in your arsenal of how to do big things and make a difference. Remember, Firms Consulting is not trying to help people achieve small dreams. It's about helping our clients solve mankind's toughest problems. So, with that introduction, let's go. Okay, so we're not going to do an introduction or anything like that. We'll build it in later when we edit the podcast. Okay. We'll just uh, get into the book, which is very interesting, by the way. So, Thank you. is there anything you want to bring up or anything you want to check with me before we start? Yeah, could you just give me a quick, how, how does this book fit into the theme of your general podcast, just so I know how you think about it? Okay, so I'll give you a quick rundown. I generally don't read books that have the word healthy or happy in the title, I'll be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> but a couple of things struck me about your book. The first thing I do when I look at a book is I go and look at the footnotes to yeah. see if the author actually referenced it and always just giving me, you know, their interpretation. There's nothing wrong if you're giving me your interpretation, but I want to see if there's some science behind it. Right. I like that. That was unusual. 
I then looked at your photo and I thought, my God, this is the best photo I've ever seen in a book. <laughs> it was so unusual. And I thought to myself, okay, Thank Whitney you. does not take herself too seriously. She kind of is a lighthearted person and I like that. Because okay. when people take themselves too seriously, they kind of preach to you, I feel. And I felt that this yes. photo is different, you know, so she's not really worried about what people think about her. She's decided to create her own image versus taking tips and cues from the publisher and stylist, and I liked that. And then the other thing I did is I read, I just flipped your book open and I started reading some of your anecdotes, and I yeah. came to Cabin Guy. Yeah, <laughs> Cabin Boy. And I thought boy. to myself, wow. And then I saw Car Guy. And then I saw a guy called Michael and thought, well, okay, at least I can get some dating tips in here. Kidding. My yeah. point is that what I liked about your book is that you made a very nebulous concept, like well-being and stress, very accessible. Okay, great. I find that these Thank topics you. are very hard to understand because it's very difficult to pin down what to do once you read a book. No one gives you these tips. And I like the fact you had these little cheat sheets at the end. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. our audience is majority management consultants. I see, yeah. And at the big firms like McKinsey, Bain, BCG, Deloitte, and so on. Mm-hmm. People who traditionally are always stressed out yeah. and have no idea what to do about it. Right, yeah. So when I read your book, I thought, well, there's two reasons why I want to speak to this lady. One is your style of writing is really interesting. And oh, it reminds me of a Woody Allen movie, and that's a compliment. Because I remember oh my movie. gosh, really? I love Woody Allen. <laughs> yeah, because he always, Not him personally, but I love his movies. <laughs> he always has these little vignettes that he weaves into his movies. And when I was reading a book, I liked the fact that you talk about something scientific, and then you'd weave in a little story about uh-huh. your life. And I love that. that. That was interesting to me. So I thought that if I like this book, and I'm a pretty difficult person to please, the audience would find it useful. Great. Okay. Thank you. That was really helpful. No problem. So and let's start with the photo, Wendy. Okay. Sounds good. So tell me about this wonderful photo. What What is in the back first? I've been trying to figure that out. It is a really, really big, expensive light that this wonderful photographer brought in because he just thought it was beautiful. And um, it, it was just a rented big light. I have, you know, this is my first... Um, real photo shoot. I don't know if you looked at my website, but yeah, I have. Um, yes. So he did all of those uh, amazing shots with all of my lab members on the floor and and very stylized and wonderful young German um, photographer who works in New York. And my um, art designer is also German, and they just did this amazing job. And I uh, I said, you know, I want to do something interesting. I want to and play. Let's let's play. And this is what they came up with. And I thought it was just uh, so spectacular. So, well, honestly, uh, your photo is really captivating. Thank you. <laughs> and what are you drinking? Are you drinking water? That's what everybody says. Those are scientific goggles in my hand. Oh, They're plastic <laughs> goggles. And everybody says, you're, well, how come you have a water bottle in your hand, Wendy? <laughs> I'm to, I, I kind of make sense to you because you're kind of healthy. So I thought, okay, yeah, you could be drinking water. That makes sense. <laughs> the scientific goggles now I get. Wow, that's an amazing photo. So, what made you decide to write this book? I mean, you've talked about it, but it's quite a lot of work to go out and capture your entire life, right? Yes, it was. It evolved um, during the process. So, at first, it was a way to just inform the general public about something that I was very, very interested in, and that is the effects of exercise on the brain. And as a neuroscientist and as a teacher, I knew that they were, they were really easy to understand, easy to grasp key points that I could make, make people understand the science and why exercise was so good for their brain and really provide a whole other motivation to be able to exercise. Not just you want to look good in a, you know, a swimsuit, but you know, for your brain, this is who you are. This is the essence of who you are. And so it started out as a much more standard science book. I'm a neuroscientist. All of my papers. Very technical initially? It was, um, no, I wanted to do it more for the general public, but it was clearly science based. But as I progressed and I worked with, so this book was written with an amazing co author, Billy Fitzpatrick, who really helped me find my voice, which is really my speaking Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. voice. And before I learned how to put that speaking voice 
onto the page. I was very, very dry and scientific because that's the only way <laughs> that I, I knew how to write. And as I was telling her the story and telling her how I became interested in telling the story to the public, she said, well, that's very motivating, Winnie. You have to include that your personal in the story. story. The personal I story. I love your personal story. Thank you. And, um, and so as I, so it really, the scale tipped during the process of writing from very, very scientific. Mm -hmm. Each chapter was going to be very scientific. Prefrontal cortex here, hippocampus there, mood and depression in the next chapter. And it tipped from that to why are you interested in that, Wendy? And can you bring us through your personal experiences with these functions and how exercise ended up changing your life. And as I added more, that's when my book agent and editor said, yes, that is going to be compelling for a general audience. And so I just went with that. Well, I, the style of writing is very good. And I, and I think it's, it is you just after speaking to you. It mm. kind of gels. It's, I can see you are that person. When I first read <laughs> the first few chapters, 40, frumpy, and I think you said focused, and I was thinking to myself, this reminds me of those Kathy cartoons from the 1990s. Do you remember them? Yes, yes. And I was thinking to myself, this is like almost a Kathy cartoon, and Kathy decided to change her life. Exactly. That you hit it on the nose. That I was, I, I used to read Kathy, and, and I, you know, uh, there are a lot of similarities. But, yeah, there was a big change that took place. And um, that's, uh, that's a subtext, obviously, of... Um, what do you think we, as a nation or as a group of professionals, we don't take stress and exercise as seriously as we should? Why? Why I not? think that's a, yeah. I think that's a great question. I think there's a lot of factors that have uh, worked against having more exercise in our lives, uh, particularly in the United States. The dependence on the car and uh, less dependence on on walking as a um, as a mode. I'm lucky I live in New York, so I, I get walk to walk a, a lot. But still, you know, first 10 years I was here, I walked from my lab to my apartment, and that's the only exercise I got ever. Right now I'm in New York, okay. uh, but I was born in California, so I know the car culture. Yes. And yes. Um, despite the fact that it was beautiful, you know, 365 mm -hmm. days of the year, I grew up in a city called Sunnyvale, and it was sunny all the time in Northern California. Uh, you know, I... As, when I was 15 and a half and I could get my car license, I got it and I drove everywhere I could. I think the food is working against the exercise because the volume of food that we are faced with every day at, at every you know, restaurant that we go to urges us to over overeat and urges us to um, eat poorly. And that increase in obesity makes it that much harder to get moving. So there's a lot of factors why... Um, and. I don't know, I wish I understood the cause of this, but one of my main um, goals is to get exercise back into the educational system, back into the classrooms of um, you know, elementary schools and, and um, secondary schools. I'm starting with NYU. I'm a faculty mm -hmm. here at New York University, and uh, I'm trying to make New York University the exercise university, and I'm working with uh, the dean of the College of um, Arts and Sciences to bring um, a voluntary exercise program um, first to a small group of freshmen um, that just started this fall, uh, and then I want to try and expand that to all freshmen to have a program a specific program to exercise not for your health. Um, I, I think there's very different par parameters. If you are trying to build muscle, this is mm -hmm. not the program for me. But the program that I'm building is one that will allow students to get the best out of this education here at New York University. Um, learning, um, remembering, being creative, and what is that specific formula? And I'm going to be working it out, and I'm going to be researching the students here um, at the same time that we're developing this program. And that's very refreshing to you because every single faculty member I speak to today wants to teach their students to code. You are the only one who wants to teach them how to exercise. And, you know, I take my hat off to you for that, Wendy. <laughs> and I was really nervous. I came to this one chapter where you're out there in your spandex in front of your class. What was it like the first time you made your students exercise before the class? I mean, how did they respond? Did they think, who's this lady and why is she giving me a hard time? Yeah, well, you know, they signed up for the class. So they knew 
there was exercise involved, but they had no idea what kind of exercise. Um, I told them they had to come to the first class in in workout clothes because we were actually going to work. So you really went out there with spandex and gym shoes and oh yeah, and you just trotted out there and just did this like you did it every day. Yes. Well, I had been practicing. You know, this was the class that I trained for and prepared for the most out of all the classes that I've taught wow. over the last. You must 20, have a lot of confidence years. to do that. <laughs> well, you know, it was fun. It was fun to go to uh, teacher training at the gym and uh, to think, oh my God, I don't how I, I'm just a nerdy science teacher. I can't be an exercise instructor, but you know what? I could. And I, um, I did it, and I trained uh, to teach the class for six months. And there were several things that were very different that day, that, that first day of that first class. Um, so one was I walked into this classroom, and this is a classroom that I've been teaching standard traditional lectures in for at least 10 years. But um, the first big thing that was different is that I was nervous. Yeah. I never get nervous before I lecture. I mean, maybe long ago when I was yeah. a graduate student, but never now. And I was, I was nervous. Um, the second thing that was different was, um, yes, I was dressed head to toe in spandex, and that was <laughs> very different get up to have. You know, I go to the gym all the yeah. time, but it's a very. I was in my academic setting in my spandex, so that was that was very, very different. And the third thing that was very different was the students. So students first day of class, yeah. um, you know, they're they're a little bit nervous, mm-hmm. a little bit excited. These students look scared. I mean, Terrified. they when they saw me walk in the classroom with clad head to toe in spandex, they looked scared, and there was a lot of nervous kind of laughter. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what was, uh, what, what was going to go on. But, you know, I got started very quickly, and um, uh, it relieved the butterflies in both my stomach and the students' uh, stomach. And, you know, it changed, completely changed the um, atmosphere in the classroom, and even without exercise, yeah. I try and teach a very interactive, very energetic classroom. I've always been an energetic lecturer. That that part didn't change. But what did change is the the atmosphere that I was able to create with the exercise. The level of energy, you know, completely went through the roof. We were doing this um, exercise that I described yeah. in the book called Intensati, yeah. uh, where there's there's spoken, oh, yelled out we're affirmations. Come to that. Yes. Yeah. So Intensati was developed by this amazing fitness instructor in New York City named yeah. Patricia Moreno. And it combines physical movements from kickboxing and dance and yoga and martial arts with positive spoken affirmations. So when you're punching like you mm-hmm. do in kickboxing, you say things like, I am strong now, or I believe I will succeed, or I am powerful, or I am inspired. And, um, you know, at first you feel like a yeah. silly, just yeah. silly yelling things out. But then you realize that actually yelling things as you're doing the exercise makes you lose your breath even more. It ups your cardio output for the workout. And once you get into it, it's, you know, it's, it feels completely empowering. So um, I tell students that, you know, you can start just kind of whispering it or saying it under your breath. But, you know, who cares? Nobody's listening to you. Yeah. And the, you're going to have the best time the, the louder you yell. And these students completely took that to heart. And they were yelling really loud. Um, I was a little bit concerned at first because this classroom is right in the main hallway of our department. <laughs> and so, you know, I was like, I found so. I was like, you know. Exactly. Yell so loud that you want that everybody down the hallway comes to see what the heck we're doing in this classroom. Now, and they did, yeah. No, no, I just want to build on that point of intensity. One of the things I do when I read a book is I always try out the routine. Oh, great. So yeah. I went on to YouTube. Yes. And I looked up intensity. Yeah. And this very beautiful tanned lady came up onto the screen. Yeah. And I think that's the lady you're referring to, right? Yes, Patricia Moreno, yes. And at first it's a bit awkward, but let me tell you something. That, I don't know what, how many videos she has, I watched one of them, but one of the soundtracks, or one of the affirmations, I think you call them, that she uses now yeah. stuck in my head, every day in every way. Have you heard that? Yes, of course. Every of course. day in every way. It's not in my head, I can't get rid of it. <laughs> and I think the thing is that, 
it, you know, when, when I was doing this, I thought to myself, okay, this is going to be another boring exercise. But here's the interesting thing. Yeah. It's almost self-reinforcing. Because yes. you do the exercise, you listen to the affirmation, you thought, this sounds very weird, you know, like you're in a cult yeah. or something. And then you stop right. the exercise, and then you go into Starbucks, and the tune is in your head. Mm-hmm. And then it reminds you to do exercise later. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of it funny. Does. It's it's unbelievable how catchy it is. And I was laughing about this when I first heard it. And then I can't get it out of my head. And sometimes when I'm in Starbucks and I start singing this tune and people look at me like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> but I, I was quite shocked because when I watched the videos, I thought to myself, okay, is this a very feminine class? Which is nothing wrong with it, but... I watched it, there were two guys in the video, but it worked pretty well. I must be, I was surprised that it worked so well. Yeah. And it's so clever. Why hasn't anyone thought of combining affirmations with exercise before? I don't know. I mean, she is a genius and she did this, created this amazing workout. I think it's really reached so many people and it's very, very powerful. And, you know, it uses, it's, it's not a secret. That's why you learn your alphabet by singing it. That is true. You sing in time and it helps you remember and you walk. So what I do is I walk down the street and I get this in this rhythm and then I say, I am strong now. And yes, people look at me weird too. So, you know, you're not alone. (laughs) (laughs) But the thing that gets me is how catchy it is when she developed it. I was thinking this is going to be very hard to remember, but when you read it, because when the first time I read about it was in your book, I thought, okay, Mm -hmm. I want it, I want it, it's never really going to work. But then when you listen to her say it and she's got all of the, you know, notes all correctly, it's very different. Yes. It's so, it's, I wouldn't say powerful, but I don't want to sound like I'm Oprah Winfrey, but, you know, it's so catchy that you you remember it forever. And I did this about two weeks ago and it's still stuck in my head. Yeah. The thing, so here's the thing. Um, um, as a student, so I was a student in this class for so many you years before. I, class, right? Oh yeah, for years. I, I taught. She taught me how to teach um, wow, in Tensati, and because the, you know, teacher training mm-hmm. is mainly here in New York, and okay. she she runs it. So I was a, t- a student uh, many years in her class, but then I became a teacher. And here's what happens when you become a teacher. Um, first, you teach her series that she wrote. She, she's a beautiful writer, and she comes yeah. up with these beautiful affirmations. But then you start writing your own. And, you know, well, how do you write these affirmations? You write them based on what you're going through, the things that are inspiring for you, the things that are grateful, that you are grateful for, or the difficulties that you're going through. That comes out in your affirmations. And so I look back on, I taught, so I've taught, I taught that class, um, and but I've been teaching a free class at New York University for six years. You know how many affirmations those are? And I can many. look back and and see what I was going through and see what I was inspired by uh, through that entire six years. And it's really a wonderful uh, record, kind of a poetic, and, and that's the thing. Um, I know, I'm a scientist. I don't write poetry. I can't yeah. rhyme. But guess what I can and I have a lot of fun doing it, and um, it's really it may it makes it even more meaningful. And that's what you should. That's why it's so me. That's why it's so powerful when Patricia shares because her affirmations are just like that. They are uh, written for a reason, a reason that is very personally relevant for her, and she shares that with with the class, either explicitly or implicitly, in the way that she teaches it. And that also brings a a, a level of power and emotion. To this workout that is usually just you know kickbox, yeah. kick harder, which is okay, but it doesn't have that heart. And, and that's do you what find that your affirmations have. changed over the six years? Yes, they have. They've been. Um, I I've become. Um, you know, I had to. I, I, first, I had a very hard time writing after yes, writing the imagine. monthly affirmations. It's like, oh no, I have to do it. I'm afraid someone will find it. <laughs> Yes, how am I going to do it? And it's, this is going to be stupid. And then I just got much more relaxed with it. And I started to play. And, um, and I would just wait, just wait and wait until that one thing happened in my life. And I'm like, that is what I'm writing my affirmation about. So, um, you know, uh, what happened last in September, I lost my classroom. 
at New York University. They, uh, because of, uh, you know, Budget space cuts. crunch, yeah. they took my space away. They took your space and away. They took my space away. I was so heartbroken. And um, I didn't know what I was going to do, and um, waiting, waiting, and I kept looking through at NYU. There was no space there. I tried to get a paid space. There's even no space there because it's very hard to get a space in New York City that doesn't cost, you know, $8,000 a month. Wow, so um, much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could, depending. But then I got, um, I was uh, tapped to give the opening lecture for a new um, public mm-hmm. space that Lululemon is opening oh, nice. right by Union Square. And um, and I told them that I lost my mm-hmm. space. She said, oh, do you still teach your class at NYU? Because she had read my mm-hmm. website. And I said, no, I lost my I lost my classroom. And she said, you know what? You can teach in this public space um this brand new redesigned public space at Lululemon um, whenever you want, and so I wrote a series um, based on 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 the importance of the spaces that we um, we inhabit mm-hmm. and how valuable that 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 space is. Because I never realized how valuable it was until they took my space away, and so. Um, so I wrote that in five minutes, and it was really fun. And are you still using the Lululemon space at this point? I, I haven't started yet. So um, they told me I could use it, um, or I met with them in October. I'm going to give the opening. It hasn't opened yet. The opening ceremony is December, I don't know, 16th or 17th. So this I'll give year? a talk there. This year, yeah, in wow. December. Goodness. And then I'll start teaching in the spring semester, which starts at the end of January. Wow, so you've got a very exciting Christmas coming up. Yes, I do. <laughs> no eggnog, lots of exercises. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So now I want to talk about some of the personal stories. And the only reason I'm talking about it is because you put it in your book, right? Yes, of course. Now, I love the personal stories because I think, you know, in the Instagram age, everyone shows a perfect side of them. Yeah. They take like 20 photos to get the perfect abs and the sun shining on their face and, you know, all those. <laughs> and, and And I think that... You know, marketers say you have to do that to make people want to be like you, but I think it scares away people, honestly. Yeah, yeah. And what I love about your stories is that here is Wendy, what's and all. She doesn't mind telling you she didn't date in high school. (laughs) And she she turned out fine. I mean, you know, (laughs) what, what was it like, Wendy, when you were writing all these stories? What were you thinking? Were you saying that there are people like me and I want them to know it's okay? Or you just said, this is Wendy. Take it or leave it. Well, um, it was just, it was just the truth, and um, you know, I I got to a point where I could see the humor in telling my little dating stories about yeah. Car Boy and Cabin Boy, <laughs> and wonderful. it wasn't so funny when I was going through <laughs> that. Sure. It really wasn't, but it's true. Those were the names that I had at that time. It's like, okay, let's see what Carboard does. And, uh, and then later it's like, actually, that's kind of funny. And funny. then I told, you know, told people the story, and they're like, that is hilarious. You're kidding. Um, so um, it, was, it was partially, you know, therapeutic. And it wasn't, it wasn't written to, you know, to inspire, you know, you know, if I write it this way, 80% of the people will be inspired. It was really being able to tell my own story with, um, with humor and, and looking back and saying, you know, I've had a hard time mm-hmm. <laughs> with some of the dating, dating issues. And I know I'm not the only one, um, but here's, here's my story. And it makes up part of me. And it's also, it was very important um, to be able to show uh, a different side of not mm-hmm. just being a woman in New York, but mm-hmm. being a scientist. So there are a lot of stereotypes about what a scientist is, and certainly um, um, stereotypes about what a woman scientist might be like. So I'm like everybody else. I have uh, difficulties. I was a science mm-hmm. nerd growing up, and um, with all the good things and bad things that go with that, and, and I have a story to tell, and I... I became a storyteller, much more of a storyteller, during the process of writing this book. And I learned that I love telling stories, and I love telling stories that are meaningful to me, um, because they meant a lot to me. And, and if they, they um, help people or, or inspire people that listen to them, that's fine. 
but I tell them because they're they're powerful for me and and they changed me in in whatever way well i mean in your book now and i'm in particularly focused on pages 208 and 209 i know you wrote the book but you probably wouldn't call it pages 208 and 209 but while your stories are funny some of them are quite deep right like the story about your dad yeah uh, and his memory the story about michael i don't know if it was meant to be humorous but i thought it was quite a you know, traumatic experience oh it was very traumatic Yes. And, and, you know, you write about these things almost in um when you write, it's, I mean, it's maybe cliche, but, you know, you, it's almost as if you're a little bit detached and you're observing yourself and you're saying, oh, look at Wendy, she went through this. And yeah. do you feel that those realizations, when you went through those experiences, it took you time to understand what they meant? Or was it something oh, yeah. that just happened? You know, um, um, they all took a little time to process. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, I think um, the the call that my story about my father yeah. and um, his his memory loss and and there were things that were that were immediate immediate. The the um, I talk about the guilt that I mm-hmm. I felt mm-hmm. because I am I am an expert on memory on mm-hmm. the. Parts of the brain important for memory, which is what I continue to study and, and um, was my main research interest before I got interested in exercise. And the fact that, you know, the realization that I'd spent my entire adult life studying brain areas important for memory, but I could do not one thing for my father who had this precipitous loss in his memory um, from kind of one week to the next and no idea what's going on. Nobody could help him. Everybody could Mm -hmm. just, all they could do was just monitor and I could do less than nothing. And, uh, you know, that was, that was horrible to go through. Um, but uh and of course uh, and then i talk about wanting to um um change my relationship mm-hmm. with my parents yeah. after this happens because of course it's a reminder they're not going to be around yeah. um all, all the time and and as i describe in my book and and this is also a, a story that i told um at the moth um storytelling hour which is a wonderful venue for for storytelling um you know i wanted to start saying I love you to my parents and and that's a That's a good um, story by the way. The con- with Thank your mom. you. Yeah, and um that was I knew that was powerful the moment that I not the moment that I decided. I was too worried about I was too scared about having that conversation yeah. and what would happen. But once I hung up that phone, I I really did realize how an important how important that conversation was in my entire adult life and and um how um, how it's going to change the rest of my life and my relationship with you know these two people that that I have the longest relationship that I've had in my entire life with my with my two parents. And actually, so, when, when I read yeah. that, I actually realized I don't think I've ever told my parents I've loved them because of cultural things, as you mentioned. I know, I know. It and was, they're it's at the very age cultural. where you know they are thinking about moving on. You know. Yeah, and I've never exactly. told them. These people have done so much for me that I've loved them. It it uh, deeply resonated with me. Yes, it does for so many people. And you know, I I had to I asked my parents whether it was okay that I mm-hmm. could tell this story because I you yeah. know I didn't want them to find out yes. <laughs> that hard. <laughs> and um, and then I so they said yes. They were very graciously said yes, both of them. And then I told them how beautiful it's been. Um, for different cultures, uh, people of different cultures to come up to me and said, oh, my God, it, I thought it was only me. Irish people have come up to me, you know, um, and uh, so it's, many different it's cultures. It's so universal. It, it is. And, my mom, and so my mom thought it was, that was fascinating. She said, oh, my gosh, I thought it was only, you know, Asian, yeah. Japanese, Japanese-American. <laughs> I said, no, Mom, it really is. We're and, completely and I, normal, Mom. Don't worry. Yes, exactly. But it, it really is so universal, and um, um, if that's not in your in your uh, ha- habit, um, it's it's a very powerful thing to be able to be reminded to do. And do you think your relationship has now changed with your mom and so on because of this? Yes, absolutely. Deeper, better. Much, much better. And I'm reminded every single week when I talk to them on the phone. It it's you know. It's a palpable 
um, difference in in our our relationship when you can say those words freely. And we do now. I mean, it was a little bit awkward at first, yeah. as I described in the story, but but now it's like um, that's, th- that's what we say. And and we mean it feels like it it's it means more now because we never said it before. We hug more as well, I'm guessing. Um well <laughs> no we're not very hugging. <laughs> no, hug okay, got it. Next step, baby step. We'll have to work that. We're yeah, we're working on the hugging. But but the I love you said so that that's going real well. <laughs> Let me tell you about how that story affected me because I think it's something that I never thought about somewhere in the book. I can't remember. You quote someone famous who says that all we have when we get older are memories, right? Yeah, Thomas Keller. Thomas Ke- yeah, the famous food writer, right? Food critic. Yes, the chef. Now, I was thinking about that. And yeah. one of the things I've remember, and I'm thinking about it very deeply. Yeah. And I was trying to think about why is it we have such good memories about food when we are young? Mm, I mean, yeah. the, doesn't matter what culture you were in, your food, you love it. You smell yeah. it and your mouth starts salivating and you get all weak need. And, and some people don't understand why do you like food like that, but it means something to you. And then I made a very important realization. Yeah. It's because we have positive memories attached to it. Yeah. And that made me change my behavior because pre- as a consultant, you know what consultants are like, we're traveling all over the world and we go to mm. a fancy restaurant and we sit there with a book and a spreadsheet and our phones and we're eating you know, expensive <laughs> truffles with a nice bottle of wine, but we don't have a good experience. Mm. And then we come out of that saying, ah, the restaurant was okay. But actually, it's because we created such a toxic environment that the food's never going to taste good anyway. And one of the things that's changed for me is I've realized that when you're going to a great place, it's about the company you keep. Absolutely. And if you have great company and you're laughing and you're half drunk and, you know, even the food's okay, the food's, the memory is going to be so amazing yeah, it's gonna make up for everything, and that's actually yeah. changed my behavior to mm, the way I great. go to restaurants now. Yeah, yeah, and and such a simple thing because and and people say, but oh, Michael, you're telling me that you, you know you're going to a restaurant and eating, but what I tell them is, remember when I'm sixty and seventy, I want to have those memories. Yeah, I want to know I I did these things, and I don't want to have bitter memories that I went to a restaurant and they cheated me because the food wasn't good, right? That's a very right. simple thing. It, it, because when we talk about memories, we forget that memory is a good memory changes your perception in life. Mm-hmm. It makes Absolutely. you have regrets or no regrets, and no one wants regrets. And right. that story, that story, did it for me. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, you read a book that's what two hundred and something pages, and that that one story really had an impact on me. Oh, that's great! And I must thank you for that because well, I'm a thank big you. You're foodie. Welcome. I'm a big foodie, but for the last, you know, when you're you're working long hours and so on, the things creep up on you and you forget that maybe the environment is not the problem, maybe your perception of the environment is the problem. Right, right. And you need something, I wouldn't say your books are kind of a kick in the pants, I like the way you write, but you you kind of put in these very nice anecdotes, vignettes I call them, you know, Mm -hmm. and and it just makes things come alive. (laughs) And that's wonderful. I mean, I, I, it's a small thing, but it really has had a big impact on my life. That's great. That's great. I'm a foodie as well, so I, I totally support the uh, enhanced, heightened enjoyment of every possible good meal that you have in your life. So, so. now when I, I tell my <laughs> friends, don't worry about the you know, Zagat rating on a restaurant. Look at the Zagat rating on your friends when you take them there. Yes, If you've got exactly. great friends, who, you know, you're going to have a good time with everything's going to be great. <laughs> now, one of the underlying currents of your book, which you don't say it, but you, but you kind of say if you, if you do these things, the outcome is confidence. You don't say mm. it, but it, it's kind of the underlying theme here, right? Yes, uh, certainly confidence, um, but also self-awareness really, really changed a lot through this process that I describe, in just my own process that I describe in the book. But yes, confidence is is definitely one of them. And I've been thinking more, it's funny that you say that, um, I've been thinking more about um, the, the act of exercising. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, the act of exercising and, and doing it regularly enough so that you notice, you know, I'm, I'm stronger now. Yeah. Physically that, and mentally. 
well, first it was physically. Yeah. You know, mentally it took a little while for me to to notice, except for the mood. The mood was definitely so. I was feeling better, and but just the realization that I can get stronger, um, physically stronger, had a huge change on my on my confidence. Yeah. It's like my my body can actually improve. It could it could be you have physically control. stronger. You have control. It's under your control. You can do it, and um, that that um, that self feeling is is something that people don't talk enough about. I mean, yeah. they measure. You can measure. Physical therapists will measure whatever your muscle mass. It's not that. It's the realization. Um, um, and the change on your on your confidence, I think that that is huge. At least it was huge for me. And this is not, you know, I'm not trying to be Mr. Mrs. Bodybuilder. Yeah. Um, I, I was just trying be. to. <laughs> I could be. Could That's be. right. That's right. So um, yes, but confidence was a, a big thing, and I continue to get confidence. Um, now it's not so much you know, how much I work out, but but my goal uh, these days is uh, waking up regularly at mm-hmm. five fifty a.m. Five fifty a.m. You're my hero. So so I could I could do my exercise first thing in the morning. It doesn't have to be a huge you know sweat inducing workout. Just a but, routine. But I'm what you're just trying to keep a routine going. Exactly, exactly. And so I have, my confidence is like, I did it this morning. So I feel really good about myself. <laughs> my confidence That's is amazing. good because I'm building that. Now, what, one of the biggest groups of readers and clients, we have are female PhDs. Uh-huh. So I yeah. think they're going to love listening to you. Why do you <laughs> think so many people think their lives are ending at 40? I don't know that. That everyone comes to forty and they and they act like they're gonna wait for retirement when they've got a good forty years left. I know it's it's ridiculous, and I think part of it has to be the youth culture um, in in our society. And you know, if you start showing some little sign of age, oh my gosh, you know, nobody on TV is looking except for the grandmas um, that are grandmas. actually not even grandmas; they're <laughs> they're they're forty. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, look look like they're eighteen. And um, you know, one of the books that had a huge impact on me is a book that I read called Healthy at a Hundred, and this book. Um, went and they analyzed all the cultures, the, the, the verified cultures around the world where there's a large population that lives above 100. And they analyzed what these cultures do. Um, they analyzed the food. So a lot of them have very little meat, um, mostly vegan, mostly vegetables. Um, a lot of them are in mountainous areas. So from the time you're born you, until the time you're 105, you're walking up and down the hill. There's no wow. elevators. You walk up and down the hill. Sounds like good cardio. Um, yes. And the third element that I thought was so fascinating. So, of course, I was into the exercise, yeah, of course. Yeah. But the third one was one I did not expect. And that was these cultures have a respect for age. And these cultures typically have age inflation, not age cutting down. You like, oh, you know, after 25, I don't want to tell you what age you I am. appreciate in value. You you add on to your age. It's like, oh, yeah, actually, I'm 65. Yeah, 65. No, you're actually 60, but you say you're 65 because that makes it sound better. And I'm like, okay, I, I can't change the world around me, but I am going to appreciate my age because, absolutely, I am smarter now than I was when exactly. I was 25. So um, I love that book because it just brought that to life and and I'm going to be healthy at 100 and I'm going to follow as much as I uh, as I can that uh, all of those principles. So it's a mindset issue, right? Absolutely. I think mindset is so powerful. It's something that's being uh, hotly studied in mm-hmm. psychology today. Um, and I think going back to those affirmations that you like that you can't get out of your mind, I think they are working on you um, to change your mindset. About so, how you feel. So it's about deciding that, look, you know, all these young people on TV, great, wonderful for them, but I'm not going to define myself by that. Exactly. Exactly. I'm not going to force myself to have that body type and, and um, um, just youthfulness to define what looks good. I, I know what makes me feel good. I know when I feel great, and, and when I feel great, I look great. And, uh, yeah, 
we need more of that in the society. Do you think it will change? I think it will change. I think we're already seeing it, right? This appreciation th- for, for who you are versus what your age is. Yes, I, I hope so. I think it might take a while to change, but um, this is something that, um, you know, it, 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 it's your choice. It really is your choice. So you can buy into all of the 25-year-old models, or actually they're the 13-year-old models. Um, or you can say, I know... I know what I, how, when I feel good, I know when I look good, and I'm going to define that. And um, so it, it really is a, a shift. And it uh, doesn't mean you can't look in the magazines for great clothes or whatever you want, but um, um, you define your, your, own, um, your own beauty. And that is so powerful, um, especially for women. Which brings us to the next chapter, which I want to spend time on, stress. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because in, in our industry, management consulting, you know, you live with stress every day, right? Yes. It is, you know, you have death, taxes, and you have stress. It's going to follow you forever. <laughs> and I think people respond to stress in different ways. I'll tell you the way I respond to stress. I fall asleep. I get sleepy. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Things are very stressful. I just want to fall asleep and not eat. Now, when you talk about stress, you, you go into the scientific issues, but you also come up with some very practical things here, right? Yes. I don't want to get into what causes stress because I think there's just too much of it, right? Right, right. I mean, there's so many. Everyone's different, obviously, so you can't generalize. I think it'll be unfair to ask you to do that. But what about the response mechanisms? Yeah. I mean, you you mentioned a few here, but I think that when you come in, a, you know, just to think of what it's like to work in a culture whereby all your colleagues are working long hours. It's yeah. A, it's a badge of honor to be mm-hmm. at the office at 7 a.m. in the morning, yeah. to work until 1 in the morning, and actually send an email at 1 in the morning so people know you were working, <laughs> and then to yeah. brag about it on a Friday night. You haven't slept, you're tired, to go to a bar with your friends and to brag about it. Yeah. How, yeah. how do you break that a monstrous cycle of self-defeat? I mean, it's, it, when you're young, it sounds wonderful, like you know, bragging rights, but then when you get to 30 and 35, it takes its you know, wear and tear on you. Right. How do you break that? You know, I think that one of the most powerful ways to break that is to make people more aware of how how much they are compromising their own cognition by the lack of sleep, the lack of exercise, the lack of regular good food. So they may, you know, be able to brag about that 1 a.m. email. Yes. But, you know, if you had an easy way to um, monitor um, your level of cognition, they would quickly see, oh my gosh, this is, this is not good. Um, and uh, this is actually uh, a direction that I'm going in to try and uh, provide this uh, to a much wider population base, the same cognitive test that I'm doing in my mm-hmm. lab, so that people can use it in their everyday life to monitor. And this, of course, comes at a time where uh, there's a huge subculture that is uh, all about self-analysis. Fitbit, how many steps did I take? What is my heart rate? Uh, How many calories did I eat today? Which are great, but what does it really matter what your heart rate is? I want to try and translate that heart rate and how often you're able to get that heart rate up into what is that doing for your brain? What is that doing for your stress levels? What is that doing for your executive functions of your prefrontal cortex? And so um, this new company that I'm, I'm developing actually will allow people to, to do that um, based on the science that I talk about in the book. Wait, did you say you're developing a new company? Yes. Well, let's talk about that. What's happening there? I didn't even know that. Is that in your book? It's not in my book because I started, I, I, you know, the book was really a, a wonderful launch pad for me to think much more globally about these things. Test and your so, message, as they say. Yeah, exactly. And so, so what, what are the implications? And, you know, I talk about this in terms of my um, paradigm shifts or, or disruptions in my life. So I, di- I talk about the personal disruption. I changed my life with exercise, you know, got a better social life. I was more confident, changed everything. I changed my professional life. Huge paradigm shift there because I changed the whole area that I, that I worked in. Yeah. But, but then it led to a realization of the most important paradigm shift that all of this work 
is leading to, which is um, paradigm shifts at, at the social level. So, as I mentioned, mm-hmm. education. Yeah. We need to get more um, education in schools, but I need evidence-based information to know how to tell people to change. Exactly. So I'm starting that at NYU. But also, what about you and I, who are interested in in tweaking their brain and, and um, making sure that I have the right level of sleep, the optimal level of sleep, obviously the optimal level of exercise. And what if I have a big presentation next week? How should I be exercising this week to prepare for that, for that great presentation that I'm going to give next week? You need to have um, um, a framework to, to be able to test yourself and, and know when you're optimizing and when you're starting to go down. Um, and, and this is the basis of the company that I'm developing to be able to do this online um, very, very easily. I love what you're doing. You know, I read the Harvard Business Review all the time. Mm. And obviously, we're management consultants. So we go into companies. We yeah. produce these very effective plans and how they can take market share and re- increase profitability, right? Yeah. But no one helps the executive ensure that he can actually do it. Right. No one's, you give the company the great plan and then you burn out the executive in the process. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and what I love about this is I believe that what the work you are doing sleep, healthy living, exercise, is the future of leadership. Yeah. Leadership is not just whether you can manage a team and set goals for them. Yeah. That's just a one-dimensional definition of leadership. Yeah. Leadership is whether you can be fulfilled in what you are doing and get up in the morning and not kill yourself in the process of of meeting a goal that some shareholder wants you to meet. Exactly. And and this is amazing. And the thing that struck me about your, you know, the chapter on, on stress reduction is the simple things you recommended here. Hug yeah. or kiss someone. Obviously, hopefully someone that wants to be hugged or kissed. Right. You? <laughs> but, but just uh, simple things, you know. Um, give yourself a hand massage, a foot massage, write a thank you note. It's yeah. the things that you could do in two minutes. Well, except for right. foot massage, but everything else, two minutes. Yeah. It's not as if you've got to go out and spend an hour and plan it for months in advance, right? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty quick. And you're right. These are management-level things. I mean, instead of writing a thank you note, go and tell somebody how much you appreciate the work exactly. that they do or tell them what the best thing that they're doing is and how you admire it. And, and I try and practice that in my own lab. And it shifts the added atmosphere. Um, and it takes less than one minute to do that. Um, and these are things that will shift your life and shift your brain. And, and if you can add on to that, and actually one of the um, markets that I'm very interested mm-hmm. in is, is the, the you know, um, big businesses yeah. where they, they want to optimize everything. And who's talking about um, brain health? Well, no they are talking, well, they are in terms of, um, um, you know, cognitive brain training that yeah. you can do. Um, but this is more holistic, and um, it's going to affect so many things from stress levels to um, optimization, strategy optimization, creativity. Um, th- that's what you want in a company, right? I mean, mm-hmm, I've never worked in a big company, but I've run my research lab for yeah. 20 years, which is like a mini company. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, you know, these are the principles that, that I'm practicing every single day. And, um, Why do yeah. you think executives are so stressed about talking about stress? I mean, think about it, right? If yeah. an executive is out there, he is never or she is never going to talk about these issues. They feel it's almost beneath them to bring it up, like it's a sign of weakness. Right, right. I remember there was an executive um, recently, I can't remember, it was a French executive, I think, or Portuguese. He runs a big financial services company and he had to take six months off to manage, to manage fatigue. It just overwhelmed him. Wow. And, I mean, I give credit That's to him that good. he did it because it shows he really cares about the company. But if you read the commentary between the lines, it's almost as if people were making fun of him. Hmm. It's almost like he's not real. He's not a real executive that he couldn't manage the pressure. But I'm thinking to myself, he is a real executive because he's being honest about things and he's fixing this before it becomes a really big problem down the line. It's almost as a cultural problem whereby we don't want to talk about these things. Right. But they're right. there it's, and it's they affect an, us every day. 
they affect us every single day. And that guy, for the build-up before he went on his, whatever, six-month yeah. break, his brain was not working well. It was fried. And I, I guarantee you that was affecting his productivity, d- affecting his decision-making, affecting his energy, because obviously he was physically unable, um, physically and or mentally unable to, to continue on. And that is not a good level to be in, either for the uh, leader, nor for your workforce. You want people that are ragged, you know, ragged, uh, uh, mentally ragged um, on your team. You want people that are strong, that are um, inspired. You cannot be inspired when you are so um, tired. And that doesn't mean you can't work hard in surges, but you have to have a, you know, a, a a plan, a framework in place to keep yourself at, you know, it's like, it's like an analogy of being an athlete. Yeah. Um, there, it's not a race every day, but you keep yourself in good training. You keep yourself tuned up so you're always at your maximum. And that is so not what people do, and, and I see this in the science field as well. Graduate students have the same kind of... Um, uh, idea that mm-hmm. they want to be the last one in the lab. They want to be the one to turn the lights off because that means that they are the best one. Well, not necessarily. No, not and necessarily. I always tell executives, you've got to distinguish between health and performance. Yeah. In the same way we tell companies, you could be performing well. You know, your share price could be high, your profits could be high, but you could be doing some very dangerous things to push those numbers up. So your company is unhealthy. Right. Like maybe you are, maybe you are front-loading sales in this quarter to get a bonus, but you're actually killing yourself in the next quarter because you won't have any sales. That's good performance, poor health, right? Yeah. And I tell yeah. executives the same thing. Just because you're performing well doesn't mean that you are doing it in a sustainable way. Right. And if you think yeah. about if you think that succession planning is so important, which it is in business, if your health is unstable and unpredictable, you're basically killing succession planning. Right. Because the company has to respond and replace you without any warning. And mm-hmm. who wants to put a company in that position? Certainly you don't want to do it. So I always find when you're having these discussions with executives, you've always got to position it as a come as a hard benefit because they don't want to talk about the tough stuff. Mm-hmm. I feel yeah. it's almost the culture whereby you're almost seen as not strong enough, which is a pity, right? Because these things are important. Right. But exactly. the one thing I've got from your book, which I would like your comment on, is what is healthy mm-hmm. eating? I've been told... And I was quite happy when I heard this, that if I eat dark chocolate and red wine, I am living a healthy life. And I thought to myself, are you serious? If I drink red wine and eat chocolate, I'm okay? So I did that. And then my doctor said, I will die young if I do. So, so you get all these different pieces of information. I'm not sure what to do now. What should yeah. I do, Wendy? What should I eat? Tell me. <laughs> well, you know... Um I'm not a I'm not a nutritionist, so I will tell you what my own you know personal yeah. um, uh, philosophy is on eating, which is um, you know it's it's common sense. Um, use moderation. Eat a whole lot of things that are um, organic and living and um, as raw as you can. Lots of raw. fruits, lots of vegetables, um, and uh, not that I love roasted. Um, Oven roasted vegetables in the winter time. That's one of my favorite really? things. Oven roasted vegetables. Make yeah, notes. I love oven roasted vegetables, and and especially um, if you add some squash in there and some sweet potatoes, and and put a little glaze on. Not too much sugary glaze, but but um, you know, just olive oil and and uh, some herbs is great. Um, I you know, if you read the National Institute of Aging. Um, the one thing they have good evidence for in terms of mitigating some of the um, mental um, um, dementia problems is is a Mediterranean diet. So, Mediterranean so diet. Mediterranean diet, fish very simple. Salad. Lots of fish, lots of vegetables, not too much dessert, yeah. not too much wine, but wine is good. Yeah. Um, you know, a little Ritter-wise, dark Ritter-wise. chocolate. Um, <laughs> they Gotta say know. that that the chemical in red is is good, but and it um, is. yes. So, um, but you know, m- again, uh, alcohol in in moderation. I am also a foodie. I love um, trying different restaurants, and and um, I will always do that. But I won't go out every night. I yeah. I try and cook, and I do cook at home a lot, and um, lots of fish. Uh, occasional meat, um, lots of uh, veggie kinds of dishes, yeah. vegetarian dishes. So, um, and and notice 
what just like with exercise mm-hmm. um it's been it's been a practice of um heightened level of self awareness how much my my memory and my attention and my mood is improved by exercise i'm noticing that all the time i'm also noticing how much um food affects um, how I feel. And for me, too much red wine does not make me feel good. Um, I can drink white wine. Um, too much red meat is, is not good. Too many desserts, especially right before going to bed, that shot of sugar is mm-hmm. not good for me. Um, but, you know, more vegetarian diet, light diet um, makes me feel energized. And um, I, for me, uh, a big uh, thing that I notice is how do I feel in the middle of the afternoon yes. when I wasn't noticing how I ate and I ate a lot of cheese and a lot, you know, uh, meat for sandwiches, yeah, yeah. bread. Um, it, not that I love bread, but just not too much bread. I would get this horrible dip in the middle of the afternoon. Yeah, me too. I felt drowsy, horrible. Change your diet. See what that does to you. Try some vegetable soup or a salad uh, with water and fruit for uh, afternoon, fruit. just it as a is. try. Yeah. And, you know, if it looks good and healthy, it's going to make you feel good and healthy. So, you know, I don't, I don't follow. Um, actually, that's not true. When I was losing weight during that period where I was, you know, 20, 25 yeah. pounds heavier than I am right now, I, um, I followed the act. Kin's diet because when I analyzed my own diet, I noticed how much bread I was I was eating. Yeah, and um, so I took out a lot of that bread and um, and not immediately, but but definitely my weight went down. And now I've put it back a little bit because I I I'm a sucker for good good bread. Good French bread. Um, yeah, good French bread. A good you know country bread. Love that. Basically, you know, I follow the the Mediterranean diet. Just everything in moderation, lots of fresh things, um, um, and that's what makes me feel the best. And every once in a while, I will try and just go vegan yeah. for, um, um, for you know, a week or so. Um, and not all the time, but um, that also makes me feel good, too. So it's, it's a lot of self-experimentation that I, that I do. You know, waking up at 5.50 in the morning, how is that going to make me feel overall? Yeah. Um, and uh, it makes me feel good. As long as I go to bed early enough, I am good for waking up early. It makes me feel good. makes me feel confident. And then how am I going to nourish my body to keep that, keep that high level of energy up? It's, it's, a, um, it's a question that you can ask yourself every day. So there's three things I noticed here. One is there is no magic bullet for yeah. diet. It's true. Everyone is different and you cannot generalize. Yeah. You shouldn't generalize, actually. Mm-hmm. Second, I mean, I like what you do. You tell us you run your life like an experiment. You try something, you watch for the result, yeah. you adjust, try, adjust, try, adjust. Right? Yeah, exactly. So mm-hmm. this is not something where we should just, you know, expect we're going to dedicate a week to fixing our diet and that's it. We're never going to think about it forever. Right. It's going to be lots of adjustments over time. And obviously, as we age and our lifestyle changes, our diet has to change to compensate for that. Yes, yes. And the third one is that nothing in excess always in moderation. Yeah. That's simple. I can do that. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be difficult for me to do that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And and notice where I get excess is when I'm really hungry. Um, then I will do something that I'm not proud of, <laughs> like I eat think, a whole bag of potato chips. <laughs> I think we've all, <laughs> we've all seen the bottom of the bag of potato chips. <laughs> and it wasn't a pleasant feeling. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, the key is just don't let yourself get that hungry. Um, and, and I tell my, I remind myself of that regularly. And it's hard when you travel. I mean, you must travel a lot. And you, you can't, sometimes you can't help it, but, but make sure that you're not in that terrible position where the only thing you have to eat is, is three cookies. And no, try to eat something a little bit you know, less bad and don't get it, let yourself be hungry when your willpower goes way down. Like yeah, mine at does. the moment, I, a lot of times I work until I cannot work. Mm. And I sometimes I work seven hours straight, eight hours straight. And then I'm just too weak to do anything and I just can just barely reach for the bag of cup of yes. or something, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's about putting yourself into a situation where you're not forced to misbehave, basically. Right. And that right. takes willpower. That's willing... 
to stop what you are doing after an hour and have a snack versus saying, oh, I'm going to waste five minutes if I have a snack. Exactly. Exactly. All simple remedies. There are no yeah. magic secrets locked away somewhere. It's true. It's true. And the healthiest people you see that I see, there are healthy people that uh, are friends that, that I really admire. It's, it's really, they know themselves. They know what they like. They know the healthy things that they like, and they make sure that those things are around. And, um, yeah, it takes a little bit of planning. Um, p- plus, it takes a whole lot of self-awareness. Um, yeah. And um, those are good things to have, and those are really good things to develop in your own personal skill set. I think it's also about, it's about looking forward to life. Yes. If you look forward to life, you want to be in a position to enjoy it. Exactly. Because if you think to yourself, oh, my life is over, it's never going to get better, you're just not going to take care of yourself, right? Right, right. Because you have nothing to live. And I think, I really think that is the reason why people decide 40 is the end of their lives. They yeah. just don't want to do anything after that. Yeah. They just wait for I mean, retirement. I, for me, it was more like I need. I need to work hard. Yeah. That's the only important thing because everybody judges me by how hard I work. The number and of nothing else. Yeah. And nothing else is important, including me, including what else makes me happy. I know what made me happy. I love Broadway musicals. I love food. But no, no, you need to work hard. So, you know, you, you uh, deprive yourself of that to work hard, and that makes you a good person. And it took many years to... Um, to get off of that. And, and I've met a lot of people that, that are like that and um, are working too hard and, real, and, and you know, telling themselves, well, this is, this is good I, because I'm working so hard. This is good. Um, without paying attention to how happy they are, how well their brain is really working, can you actually optimize that? Is your formula right? My formula was all wrong. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's what I changed. That's what you read about in the book, how I gradually, um, step by step, realized what was wrong. Um, it reminds yeah. me of that Shakespearean play, The Merchant of Venice. Mm. Everyone has to give their pound of flesh. <laughs> and this is how the society is structured. People believe they have to sacrifice enormous amounts, including their health, yes. before they deserve the right to enjoy life. Exactly. What is that about? I, I don't I, know. Maybe everyone yeah. read The Merchant of Venice. I have no idea. <laughs> it's a horrible way to live your life. It is. It is. And so many people have that. And, and they joke about, oh, why am I doing this? I'm, I'm on the you know, running wheel. I'm a yeah. little rat on a running wheel. Change it. Just it doesn't exactly. mean... They think the alternative to that is becoming a hippie on the beach. That is not. There's nothing wrong with being happy on the beach, right? Let's just be clear. That's a good life if you think about it. Yes, yes, but too many people they they need that they need to be good at work, and it's it's the the point is you don't have to be that rat sacrificing everything on the running wheel to be the best that you can be at work. In fact, my contention is that you are going to be better at work if you change that rat on the running wheel attitude. And instead, you start paying attention to how much exercise you personally are getting. What is your food intake? What is your energy level in addition to what your productivity is? And what I say a lot in my talks is, you know, I tell people about this story that I went through. And this is a story about when I stopped working as many hours, I became much more productive at work because I spent those hours on myself, on the gym, on relaxation, on meditation, and my brain was in a much better state when I went back to work. I've also found the same thing. I feel really guilty when I don't work. Mm, I feel like clients are paying me and I'm wasting their money. And then (laughs) over the last few days, I decided, you know what, fall in Toronto is so beautiful. Mm. It's so warm. We're having 12, 15 degree temperatures today. Wow. I'm going to take the week off and I'm going to just think about client prompts. I'm not going to do stuff. Yeah. And we're working on this big data project. And yeah. I was shocked at how much better my thinking was just by taking three days off, just to think about it. No writing, just to walk around and keep it playing in the back of my head. Yes. We equate activity with output. Right. When you can be enormous, you know, people forget productivity is very simple. It's the value of output divided by the cost of the inputs you put in. 
Mm-hmm. If you're putting a lot of time in, but you're not actually improving, you're actually becoming less productive. Yeah. And what we, we forget to do is we get caught into the cycle whereby we don't want to change the way we do things, so we just do more of things that don't work because it makes us mm. feel good that we've come in at 9 a.m., whatever time we come in and leave at 5 yeah. p.m., right? Yeah, yeah. I, I was listening to, well, I don't listen to Tim Ferriss, but I listened to the recent, um, you, do you know what Tim Ferriss is, right? Everyone knows him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, so I listened to the recent interview he did with Kevin Costner. Uh-huh. And Kevin Costner, and he, 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 I was skipping through it, but the one part I listened to is where Kevin Costner said what changed his life. And he said that what changed his life and what made him more successful is when he stopped listening to other people. Uh-huh. And he did what was good for him, what would make him happy, and he forgot about accolades and achievements. Yeah. He built things, well not built, he produced, I think is a correct word, he produced things that he found fulfilling. Mm. And he didn't worry if there was a market for it. He just felt yeah. this makes me happy. This yeah. is who I want to be. And and if you read, I mean, I, I, one of the hobbies I have, which tells you I'm a bit of a nerd, is I like reading the Nobel Prize speeches. Oh, yeah, those are great. Those are amazing. And there's one guy, uh, J. Robin Warren, uh-huh. who I've had, you know, I, I've met him, uh, not met him personally, but I've spoken to him once or twice before. Uh-huh. And, and he won the Nobel Prize because he was able to show that ulcers are caused by a bacteria in your gut uh-huh. and not stress. Stress makes it worse, but it doesn't cause the bac- it doesn't cause the ulcer. Interesting. And, and he was saying that when he started doing this, and he's not a proper doctor, I think he's a pathologist. He okay. said that everyone told him that he was wrong. Mm, yeah. No one would publish his journals. Yeah. No one would look at his research. And he said mm-hmm. the reason he kept on doing it is because he stopped waiting for the adulation from his peers. Yeah. And he yeah. just followed the data. And he said, look, either there's something wrong with me yeah. or that someone's manufacturing the data. But I collected mm-hmm. the data, so, this, so there must be something wrong with me. I'll put it out there and let's see what people said. And he won the Nobel Prize for just doing what he thought was right. And look how successful he became. And imagine if he had changed the data or didn't publish it because everyone thought he was crazy. Right, right. So whenever I t- whenever people say, but Michael, everyone says this is conventional wisdom, I always say, read the work of J. Robin Warren. Mm. Because it tells you that you have to do what you believe in. Yeah, yeah. Now we've completely gone off track, which I love about interviews. <laughs> but I do want to leave you with one thought. Okay. When I was reading your book, and uh, your book has been, I mean, I'm not just saying this, I'm quite a direct person, honestly, but it's, it's made me think about a lot of things that I should do differently. Mm. The one thing that, and you know, I have to sum it up, we've been brought up to believe in mind over matter. Mm. You think something and it changes the world. Your book is a little bit different. The way I, what I took out of this is that sometimes if you just change, your, you just change what you do, it affects your mental state. Mm-hmm. Matter over mind. <laughs> that's what I took out of this hmm. we like to think we're so brilliant we're so clever people that we just <laughs> think something is going to happen but sometimes we don't know what's best we just have to try things and then wait for my hippocampus to change in size <laughs> and then good things will happen right <gasps> thank you so much Wendy I really thank enjoyed you, this Michael. Talk. oh thank you I had a great time I'm looking forward to your next book by the way thank you Okay, and, I'm starting to work on it, actually. <laughs> and when you have launched your new business, please let me know about it. I will, absolutely. I have so many absolutely. clients who want to... I think that a lot of people would benefit from this. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I have a colleague who's working on something very similar to you, actually. Uh-huh. She's looking at how sleep impacts executives. Yes, and I very, very important topic. And I should speak and break bread and see what happens. Would love to. Absolutely. I will, I will send you an email afterwards and put you in touch with her, okay? Please do. Yeah. Wendy, thank you so much. It is such a pleasure speaking to you. I mean, you really are a different kind of person. <laughs> I mean that in the greatest possible compliment. I thank feel, you so I'll, much. I'll be quite honest. I mean, every time I speak to someone, I always feel they're pushing an agenda, but I don't see that at all with you. I mean, you're just you. You're just telling me your story, and that is, you know, you want people to benefit, and I think the world needs more people like that. Oh, thank you so much. So, so this was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. I'll let you know when we publish it. Yeah. And uh, we'll we'll do a little. We have uh, if you, if you read the Wall Street Journal, you've seen those pencil sketches. Uh huh. We do one of every person that we interview, so we're going to do one of you as well. 
Oh, fantastic. If you have a special photo you'd like converted to a pencil sketch, you can always mail it to us. Okay. Otherwise, we will use the one in your book, which I think is pretty cool. Yes, use that one. Okay, I'll that do that, Wendy. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Michael. We will definitely, definitely keep in touch. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Strategy Skills Podcast. Stay up to date on all of our latest training by signing up for our email updates on firmsconsulting.com. We look forward to helping you develop your strategy, critical thinking, decision-making, and communication skills next time here on the Strategy Skills Podcast. Thank you.